Well, hello, everybody. Hi. My name is Brad Kraft, and I'm a bookseller here at the University Bookstore. Um, this evening, I have the privilege of introducing a writer who, among his many accomplishments, has just achieved, with this book, a rare distinction in American letters. Some of you will be old enough to remember the Oscar-winning actor and comedian Red Buttons, a man who basically made a living for decades with just the one joke. For example, Alexander the Great, who said at his wedding night, it's only a nickname, never got a dinner. <laughs> or Lot, who said to his wife as she was being turned into a pillar of salt, salt we got plenty, coffee we need, <laughs> we never got a dinner. And on he would go, this one and that one, never got a dinner. Just jokes, of course, good ones, as our guest tonight might say. But the point is, they are to be made once more. There's been many a great man and woman, as Mr. Buttons might have said, who never got a dinner. More directly to the point this evening, the list of great American writers who have achieved the body of work, the readership, and the reputation to justify the publication of a reader is not long. For any who might not know or remember, a reader in the sense of the word just here is an anthology of one writer's work meant to introduce or recall the style and personality of some singular author. Surveying just the shelves of my personal library last night, I find the following American authors with a reader in my own collection. Abraham Lincoln, Ring Lardner, James Thurber, S.J. Perlman, Ogden Nash, Dorothy Parker, H.L. Mencken, A.J. Liebling, and Florence King. You will note the common ancestry of everyone on my list but Lincoln can be traced back one way or another to Twain, and thence, I would hazard, to Washington Irving. There's good common and economic sense to this precedent, though I admit to not having noticed it before last night. Without accepting the 16th President of the United States, every writer on my list has, one way or another, at one time or another, been dismissed with the critical epithet of humorist, as if to suggest that amusement was somehow the mark of an inferior, fundamentally unserious artist. I need not remind this audience of the truth in the old saw as to which is more difficult, tragedy or comedy. Furthermore, I would argue that the reason every writer on my list, and again, not entirely accepting the great emancipator, has continued in the affection of the reading public to this day, is precisely because, in addition to the quality of their poetry and prose, we recognize and appreciate a good time when and where we find it. Any that don't, often as not in my experience, teach literature, and the ones who think they can tell a joke and can't, teach theory. <laughs> Mr. Garrison Keeler has written short stories for The New Yorker, novels, reminiscence, and politics. He's written what's called a straight play and a screenplay in his time, satire, poetry, and books for children. And, I understand, he is working on a musical. All of this might, I add, oh, pardon me, all of this I might add, while keeping what might be called his day job in radio since at least 1974. I can think of no other contemporary writer with whom we may all be said to feel both so familiar and foolish fond. And no other American writer of our time on whom we may still count for such wit as this, quote, it is a sin to believe evil of others, but it is seldom a mistake. <laughs> Worthy, I should think, of Ambrose Bierce. And I know of no other American writer of whom I might unquestionably accept the truth and sincerity of the following sentiment, quote, even in a time of elephantine vanity and greed, one never has to look far to see the campfires of gentle people. So, tonight, joining that select company of American writers, finally, with a well-deserved reader, it is my honor and pleasure to give you, gentle people, a great American writer, a writer who has created in Lake Wobegon a better world even than we remember, perhaps a better world than we deserve, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Garrison Keeler. Ooh. Somehow I wish I had come out before that introduction. <laughs> and, uh, 
I only wish that my mother were alive to hear it, my goodness. <laughs> she had no idea who she produced. <laughs> well, I suppose maybe she does hear it somewhere. Well, here we are in the midst of literary criticism and poetry and poetry and fiction over there and, uh, and English as a second language, which uh, it may well become for some of us <laughs> writing and reference as well. It's good to be here near this great uh, campus, even though being close to a university campus uh, just uh, brings back memories of um, dreadful failure and, uh, and misery, but we need not talk about that. <laughs> we need not talk about that. It was uh, about three years ago, I had an appointment to go down to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota for an MRI to see if they could figure out why I had these uh, chronic headaches. It was uh, in February, three years ago, and I was in St. Paul at home. I was at home alone and uh, stayed up late and, uh, and then got up very early the next morning. I had an eight o'clock appointment and I got up around five and sheets of snow were falling. It was a genuine blizzard um, except without so much wind blowing in the city, you could not see the house across the street. And uh, I seldom listened to the radio, but I did turn on the radio uh, <laughs> that morning. And, uh, and they said, no unnecessary driving. Highway Patrol says to stay off the roads, which for somebody from Minnesota is like a bugle call. And, <laughs> So you get into your old Volvo and never mind uh, your boots and your scarf, uh, just, just get in your car and, and head down the road, lest somebody stop you. And uh, so I headed on my way down uh, Highway 52, which is a, a four-lane divided highway uh, heading south from St. Paul to Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, goes through Zumbrota and uh, Cannon Falls, and visibility was really poor, uh, but I was going about 55, <coughs> almost 60, and uh, a semi pulled up in the passing lane on my left, a semi pulling a trailer of steel pipe, and uh, he pulled up even with me. And for reasons that uh, I can't explain, but uh, many men here will understand, um, I did not want him to pass me. And I decided that he would not. And so I stepped on the gas and uh, we were, each of us going about 65, in very little visibility. I was busy at the time. Uh, my wife was in New York and she had called me on the cell phone. So I was listening to her. She was uh, crossing Central Park uh, at around 90th Street and she was on her way to have coffee with a friend of hers who sings in the Metropolitan Opera Chorus. And she was uh, then gonna go to the uh, Metropolitan Museum and see the Matisse exhibit. Um, and she was, so delighted, there were, there were crocuses coming up in the park and, and she could see the leaves of tulips. So I was listening to her on the cell phone and I was also trying to get a CD out of the CD player, <laughs> which had gotten stuck in there. And, uh, and so I, my hands were occupied and, um, and I was sort of bracing my left thigh against the steering wheel, heading south at 65 miles an hour through sheets of snow with a semi a few feet off the, uh, off the port side. And uh, we came over a rise where the, the wind was blowing snow across a cornfield, across corn stubble. And, uh, and uh, it was a drift about three feet deep I would guess, 
and uh, about a quarter mile long, and we hit it, he and I, together at the same time, and snow just boiled up this snow that you caught in your in your in your headlights and just blinding white. It was like the rapture. It just came <laughs> up in your in your face. I didn't take my foot off the gas. <laughs> I just didn't think to do that. I did hear this long diesel honk and uh, and uh, then we got out of the out of the blindness and I discovered that I was in the left hand lane and he was now in the right hand lane. <laughs> and he was he had fallen behind, but he was catching up quickly. And he was making some sort of hand gestures. <laughs> See. It was a chastening moment for a, Minnesota man, I reached up and I, I fastened my seatbelt and, uh, <laughs> and uh, headed on down to Rochester, staying barely ahead of him and, and uh, made it on time for my um, eight o'clock appointment. You go down to radiology and they give you a dressing room, you take off your clothes, you put on a little flowery gown, one fore and one aft and you, and you lie down on a gurney, they wheel you into where the great cyclotron is and you climb onto a little platform that's on a rail and they run you up the rail until your head and shoulders are inside the machine for half an hour of wanging and banging and dinging and honking. You lie there and you keep your eyes closed lest you have an attack of claustrophobia. It's very cramped inside the MRI machine. You have your eyes closed and you realize that this platform on which you are lying is about exactly the size of a coffin. <laughs> and, and your hands are folded on your abdomen and <laughs> your eyes are closed and you sort of imagine your loved ones walking by and looking down at you and uh, wondering why you're wearing this flowery gown. <laughs> they finish and you, and you wait for half an hour to talk to the neurologist and um, he calls you into his office. He's a man of science. He's very matter of fact. He has a picture of your brain there on his computer screen on his desk. Your brain, your, the, the center of your being as a writer where all of, your, all of your material is, everything that's ever happened to you, everything that you might ever write about in the future is all up there. You do not want to look at it, but you do. And he points to two little dark spots on it. Those are blood clots, he says. Those were fired up out of your atrium and they lodged there, luckily, in what we neurologists refer to as a silent part of the brain, a place where not much is going on. You, <laughs> you might think of this as the Wyoming of the brain. <laughs> Some people have more of it than others, and, uh, and, and, and there, they, there they landed by pure chance. Had they landed just about a millimeter over here, you would have major speech issues now, and you probably would need to be relearning how to, how to take basic sounds and make them into, into words, which you did with much less trouble when you were a year and a half, two, three years old. You would be struggling with that had it landed right there. And had one landed right there, you would have some mobility issues and uh, you might have to be seeing a physical therapist to relearn how to, how to walk. He said this all just very matter-of-factly and I listened to it and uh, went off to think about it 
down in the cafeteria having a bowl of Campbell's tomato soup and, and an egg salad sandwich, which I've always found to be comforting and thinking about how, how close one came to disaster. We all know, in, intellectually at least, uh, um, about the precariousness of, of life, but, but here it was, right there before your, before your eyes. This could have been very different, you think to yourself. And you look around the cafeteria at Mayo and you see all sorts of elderly people your age who, uh, for whom things have turned out differently. You sit and you ponder this. And what occurs to you is that you have been granted an enormous stroke of good luck which carries with it a certain obligation to do something with this, with this good fortune. How fortunate for you that you did not wind up in a ditch under 15 tons of steel pipe <laughs> so that you could come to Mayo and find out how lucky you are. <laughs> this, um, it seems to me, is the uh, is, is, is the great lesson that one learns at this um, advanced age where, where I've arrived uh, without really meaning to. Um, <laughs> that it's not about hard work, although, although we do work hard, oftentimes uh, doing um, exactly the wrong thing. Um, and it's not about talent. Nobody really knows what that is. Exactly. It's about blind, stupid luck. This is what I have come to believe. And this is why I'm not asked to deliver the commencement address at colleges or universities. Because <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a truth which has been withheld from young people such as yourselves. <laughs> They want you to believe that you are, you are special, which indeed you are, as everyone is, but blind, stupid luck. My advice, in a nutshell, is to be prepared to be lucky and uh, recognize it when it's there. And when it comes to you, feel profoundly grateful and, and, then, and then go on and do something else. This is... This is what I see looking back at my own life. This is the thing about being 71, is that you can see things a little more clearly looking back over your own life. And you, and you see how small events carried great sway, how, how when Mr. Beeler kicked you out of shop class because you were failing ball peen hammer and you were <laughs> failing plywood and sheet metal and you were talking, he kicked you up into Miss Lavona Pearson's speech class and this made an enormous difference to, to give a speech and to look out over your classmates and not look at them because they were, because they were making faces, they were crossing their eyes, their, they were letting their, their tongues droop from their mouths, they were pulling invisible things out of their nostrils. You look back at Miss Pearson and she stood in the back of the room smiling at you, this beautiful beatific smile, and that smile follows you, you never forget this. Nothing you do for children is ever wasted. It carries and carries and carries, even though you may never see the outcome of it. You look back and you see the time that you went out for football because you grew up in a football town and this was what boys did. But the doctor heard a click in your mitral valve and wouldn't sign the permission slip, which was 
heartbreaking for about an hour and a half, and, uh, <laughs> and then you, on your own, got the bright idea to go down to the town paper and ask if they needed a sports writer, knowing that they didn't have one. This was a failing paper. It was, it was about to go out of business about two years later, the Anoka Herald. And the editor, Mr. Feist, looked at you, this, this kid with wire-rimmed glasses and a home haircut standing there in his office door in front of the glass case full of wedding invitations. And he decided on his own that, that you were the son of Lawrence Keeler, who was the vice president of the First National Bank of Anoka. He didn't know that you were the son of John Keeler, <laughs> who worked in the post office sorting mail. And because the First National Bank held the mortgage for the paper, you were hired <laughs> on the basis of false identity. And you were happy for it and never saw reason to correct it. And so instead of sitting down at the end of the bench with the other B-squatters, you sat up in the press box, way up high over the field, and you sat very close to the men from the AM radio station who were doing play-by-play, -play, Chuck and Rod, so that you knew what was going on. <laughs> and you wrote a story for the paper, and you took it down to the paper on Monday afternoon, and you gave it to Whitey or Russ, the two linotype operators, both of them <coughs> confirmed alcoholics, <laughs> who sat there at the linotype machine and, and drank this horrible paint thinner out of Dixie cups. You gave it to them and they set it in type and these enormous machines that, that, that gave off clouds of heat because there was an open flame under the bucket of lead, so when he finished typing a line, he pulled a lever and, and the lead poured in to make the slug and the slug went into the galley and the galley up on the chase and the turtle went down into the flatbed press and you could come in on Wednesday and see Whitey stand there and, and, and take one sheet at a time off this great stack of newsprint and, and lay it down flat and pull the lever and whoosh, the, the whoosh, chunk ka chunk ka chunk the, 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 the roller came over and then down it slid into the, into the folder which trimmed it up and you could reach down into the chute and pull out a folded copy of the Anoka Herald and turn it to page 12. And there, under your name, was your story, and you could imagine hundreds of, uh, dozens of people, <laughs> your aunts anyway, uh, <laughs> looking forward to reading this. You never get over this. This is, this is, this confirms you in a choice, the love of paper and fresh ink is, irresistible. It's why I love bookstores. I can walk in and, and smell that smell and, and it's freighted with all of these beautiful, beautiful memories. You look back on these things and, and you just see one stroke of luck after another. You see your own grievous mistakes and you see your own arrogance and your own carelessness and, and, and all of your own faults, but your life is marked by these strokes of, of luck. I believe in this. I really, I really, truly do. Radio was a piece of great luck for me and nothing that I ever planned or had ambitions to do, truly. I wouldn't lie to you about it. I might lie to you about other things, but, <laughs> you know. My ambition was to be a writer and to be, a, and to be brilliant, to be a genius, actually. 
And, um, and that's what I was planning on. My model was Edgar Allan Poe, I think, um, and, his, and his love poems to dead women, which uh, I, I truly love, the lost Lenore and, uh, and Annabelle Lee, whose, whose kinsman came and bore her away from me and shut her up in a sepulcher in a tomb by the sounding sea. This was my idea of great poetry. And then I, and then I read a little bit of Jack Kerouac, and uh, and then I was impressed by that and by the idea of, of, of stream of consciousness sentences that went on for pages, and all of it opaque and surrealistic and sort of tortured. That was my idea that 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 a brilliant poet would die young. Probably, this would be your obligation, really, to to your own. <laughs> to your own talent, not to, not to venture onto the shallows of middle age, you know, but, but to die in, in the bloom of youth like, like Buddy Holly did and, and like Janis Joplin and, and James Dean so that you would be immortalized as, as a 20-year-old and people would grieve for your talent and your short life which didn't give you enough time to bring this talent under control. I wasn't sure that I had this talent uh, was one problem. Some people thought I did because I was a loner and I was bookish and I, and I didn't make eye contact, which I still don't. I mean, it doesn't make sense in radio. And, uh, <laughs> Nowadays, they would say high-functioning end of the autism spectrum, but, but back then they, they had a more generous interpretation of eccentricity back when there was so much less of it. And uh, so I assumed I would die young, and, uh, and I set out to write uh, dark, surrealistic poetry. Um, but there just wasn't occasion for it, you know. Um, death, that is. Um, I was cautious by nature, and uh, uh, there never was a good reason to charter a small plane in a snowstorm. <laughs> um, heroin was very hard to find in rural Minnesota <laughs> at the time. Not now, but, uh, but back then. It was, and so I lived on to the age of, of 30, and, uh, and that's really too old to die young. And <laughs> that's when I came up with uh, my so-called career in, uh, in radio and a Prairie Home Companion. It started out early in the morning. It wasn't on Saturday um, at 5 o'clock Central Time three o'clock Pacific. It was, it was early in the morning and just broadcast in, in Minnesota. And when you got up at five o'clock in the morning to do a radio show, uh, it dawned on you that this, that this dark vision you had for yourself was no longer of any use at all. You had to find something else. I come from this era <coughs> in which, as you may know, um, all major American writers uh, were confirmed alcoholics. And the English department at the University of Minnesota was the most alcoholic department in, 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 in the entire country. They, they were very uh, jealous of their status and they, <laughs> And, and they protected it and extended it. Um, this was a time when, when all great writers were, were self-destructive people. They were chain smokers and they were, and, and they were alcoholics. Uh, Faulkner and Hemingway and, and Fitzgerald, of course, and Sinclair Lewis and, uh, and uh, Eugene O'Neill, Tennessee Williams, Thomas Wolfe, Dylan Thomas. Uh, the, list goes on and on and on. Maybe not Laura Ingalls Wilder, but, uh, <laughs> but then who knows? Uh, 
And so an English major back in the day felt a certain obligation, you see, to take up the tools <laughs> of your trade, which were unfiltered cigarettes. Uh, Galois was the preferred brand, French, um, but if you couldn't afford that, then Pell Mells would do, Lucky Strikes, Camels, and to smoke two, three, four packs a day was a sign that you were serious about writing. <laughs> and to drink as much as anybody else in the room and hold your own was, was the other way that you that you showed this. This all changed now. I mean, there, there are there are writers who go to gyms, for God's sake. <laughs> writers who jog, you know, you get together with, with uh, young novelists and, and they sit there drinking carbonated Italian water. And uh, so this is all different. But back in the day, this was, this was the case. To have this dark, view of your of your of, of, of genius that, that 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 genius and and this suicidal impulse were intertwined and you had to have both in order to make your way in the field of, of literature. This feeling was very, very strong. Well this all changed when I went into Radio, five o'clock in the morning, um, a dark view of life is not of any use or, or importance. Your listeners have their own dark view and they're not interested in yours. You are supposed to be a figure of some cheerfulness, not too cheerful because this is the Midwest, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, a, a strong, forward-looking, sort of scoutmaster, uncle-like person who, who, who plays rousing music. Not too rousing, but you know, <laughs> does surprising things and, and, who, and who offers a spirit of optimism and hope to people, uh, which required that, though this was non-commercial public radio, I had to invent sponsors because advertising is a platform for optimism and hope. False hope, but nonetheless. <laughs> and so from that I created uh, powder milk biscuits uh, made from whole wheat that give shy persons the strength to get up and do what needs to be done and, <laughs> and uh, bebop, rebop, rhubarb pie. Nothing gets the taste of shame and humiliation out of your mouth, like <laughs> bebop rhubarb pie, rhubarb the secret of the good life as we know it, and the ketchup advisory board, ketchup <laughs> filled with natural mellowing agents, and, and all the rest of them. I invented sponsors to give me a chance to use a tone of voice that you couldn't, you know, that you'd be hard put to find a, a reason to use elsewhere, simply talking about yourself and your own experience, because I wasn't that cheerful <laughs> at five o'clock in the morning. I had to invent cheerfulness. You know, I, I felt as so many people would feel who go to work at five o'clock in the morning, that you're wasting your life and that you are unappreciated and, uh, and you can't wait to quit. No, I, I, th this, all, this all happened without taking thought. And then having created sponsors, it was a natural next step to create a town where these products would come from. And I gave it the name Wobegon from the Ojibwe word that means the place where we waited for you two days in the rain. And, <laughs> Then to populate it with German Catholics and Norwegian Lutherans and to create the Sons of Canute and, and Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility and <laughs> the Norwegian Bachelor Farmers and the Sidetrack Tap, the Chatterbox Cafe, Ralph's Pretty Good Grocery, all of those. And without 
intention. Truly, without intention, you find that you have created this magnum opus that you will spend 40 years talking about and still feel you've only begun to scratch the surface. This is amazing, especially compared to the novel I was writing when I went into radio, which was dreary and which was hopeless and which I was glad to execute. <laughs> it was a novel about Minneapolis, which was the biggest city I knew anything about, and the narrator was a young, alienated, so I thought, a young man who was an outsider, the worst possible narrator because he didn't know anything. In Lake Wobegon, just about every character knows a great deal about just about every other character so that you can choose your narrator from any, from any part of town. This is beautifully complicated, I think. Blind luck, and that's the message. That's the message. I'm not here to sell this book. Um, it's, um, it's a compilation of things I've written over the years. Uh, but there are some good sentences in it, and uh, uh, a, a number of sentences that, I, that, I, that I'm fond of. And uh, so I may as well just quote them. Um, and then we'll see if there are any questions from this fine uh, seminar here here in the literary criticism poetry section of University Bookstore. This is my favorite, this is my favorite. Uh, the way to get something done is to do it. And the way to stop doing something is to not do it anymore. <laughs> Isn't that good? I, lo I love, I love that story. I wish, I'd, I wish I'd known that when I was your age, but uh, you know, we, we, do, we do the best we can. There's only so much you can do and you should do that much, and when you do that much, you will find out there is more that you could do and you should do that as well. Uh, be kind to strangers. You were a stranger once yourself and you will be again. On the other hand, your home is not the bus depot. <laughs> Scripture says to give all that you have to the poor, but if you did, then you would be poor and then they would have to give everything back. <laughs> so that isn't gonna work. But anybody can give 10%. Do unto those who don't like you before they can do what they want to do unto you. Do good to them before they can do the despicable things you know they would like to do <laughs> to you. Kill them with kindness. Poison them with politeness. Use Christian charity as a weapon. <laughs> Never talk about the relationship with the other person. Just don't, you're digging a hole for yourself. <laughs> and no matter how gentle and kind you think you are, you will say something in the course of this discussion that will scorch their heart and they will remember it for years to come. Never talk about the relationship with the other person and never use the word relationship. Either it's a friendship, or it's a romance, or you're already married, or you're related, or you're in business together, your classmates, your neighbors, something. The solution to your problems almost always is to have more fun. This is how you solve these problems with another person. The secret of mothering and fathering is to make no sudden moves. Don't 
raise your voice, give the child plenty of room, keep all thoughts of disaster to yourself. And insofar as possible, find something that you and the child both enjoy doing and do it even if it almost kills you. <laughs> Tall people cannot count on short people to take care of things that we would bump our heads on. <laughs> we have to look after these things ourselves. They will leave the cupboard door open <laughs> so that you chopping onions on a chopping block on the counter your eyes filled with tears, suddenly you stand up and you ram your head into the corner of the cupboard door hard so that you forget the words to America the Beautiful. <laughs> this is your own fault. You cannot blame this on other people. <coughs> Likewise, if you expect a good birthday party, past the age of 18, you have to give it yourself. You can't <laughs> hope that other people will rise to the occasion. Wonderful things can be done in small increments. And if you, coming home at night, put your billfold or purse, your car keys, your glasses, your cell phone, in a dish by the door. With the time you save not looking for them the next morning, you will be able to write war and peace. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make fun of crazy people. You may well be one of them. <laughs> Take care of your friends even when they lose their interest for you because there will come a time when there is no reason to like you except out of long-standing habit <laughs> and you will want those people at that time. Life is short. Don't put beans up your nose. <laughs> On the other hand, don't buy cheap shoes. My favorite, and I'll close with this, because this, I think, was the precept of my parents. Cheer up. Cheer up. It could be worse. Someday it will be. <laughs> be thankful for the difference. So that's that. Any questions from this um, interesting group of people here? Uh, anything that uh, I left out of this um, discussion here that you are curious to know about? Yes, you're thinking of asking a question, and yeah, uh, I, and you're, you're just trying to word it I, I exactly. Want word it, I want to word it well. You, you want to word it well because you know you're talking to an so, English major here, and <laughs> you want to. You seem to have a phenomenal. I'm sorry. Here, here. You seem to have a phenomenal memory to be able to quote things out of your book and to do all the stories that you do and to bring it all like it's fresh. What's your process of doing all of this? I mean, how, how does it work in your world to remember all of this? You will remember anything you've written that, uh, that, 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 that made sense. I mean, you may not remember it exactly when you need to know it, but, but you will remember it. There's no reason to, to read a speech off, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I don't do it. The news from Lake Wobegon is, you know, off the top of my head, and uh, <coughs> it's like Mark Twain said, when you tell the truth, you don't need to remember what you said last time. So, Truthfulness. Do you believe me or no? Do you believe me? <laughs> I got some lakefront property in Minnesota. But, uh, 
<laughs> we could uh, we could talk about. No, I don't have a I don't have a great memory, but um, but you know I, I work at it and uh, and it's and it's good um, it's good to stand up in front of people without notes and 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 in this way, panic you know delivers <laughs> delivers you some some material. Yes, uh, the the young lady with the with who's turned out very well turned out in the in the beautiful hat as if you're going to a a christening or something here. Not, yes. Not yet. Um, I was wondering, do you have a maritime background? I heard a lot of uh, port and forward and aft references in your story, and I was wondering if you have a maritime background to back that up. Is that all you need for a maritime background? <laughs> My husband is like third generation, so he never, uh, maritime, so he never goes to the bathroom. It's always the head, and it's always uh -huh. port uh -huh. and starboard for giving directions, so I just heard yeah. that a lot, and I was curious. Yeah. Well, I haven't gone to the head, and, uh, <laughs> and I doubt that I will, but uh, no, I'm just, I'm just uh, t tossing out the word uh, port there to, you know, to sound more sophisticated. And, uh, <laughs> Fore and aft. I mean, uh, I mean, how else would you say that? You, that you put this gown on your front and this gown on your back. But I, I don't know. Fore and aft just seems a little fancier. Um, no complaints. But uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't have any other maritime terms. Those, that's the limit right there. And uh, so not much more I can do. Yes, sir, in the back. Is there a relationship between Lake Wobegon and Holdingford, Minnesota? Is there a relationship between Lake Wobegon and Holdingford? Well, Holdingford is an interesting uh, town. Uh, it's a town with two uh, Catholic churches, uh, one Polish and one German, which have been unable to uh, unable to work out a merger. Uh, they have they have one priest who serves both, and and their services are conducted in English. But one is Polish and the other one is is German. I admire that kind of uh, stubbornness, and uh, and uh, so um, so may maybe in some in some part. I think I think Lake Wobegon is maybe a little bit larger than. Holdingford. Holdingford has a beautiful water tower, one of those great, beautiful, classic water towers that sits on, uh, sits on what is it, six legs, and, uh, and, and the tank up at the top and the name printed on the side. Um, so I, I, I'm fond of uh, Holdingford, but I don't know anybody in Holdingford, and so I don't know anybody well enough to exploit their, their <laughs> stories, you see. So. I'd like to imagine that it's based on holding for. Would you believe me if I said it were? Yes. Okay. All right. Then it is. Uh, it's holding for. It's holding for. Uh, block by block and and person by person. Yes, sir. It, it it appears to me, or as I listened over the years to your radio show, Prayer Home for the that is it's almost modeled after uh, going to church where you have your songs, you have your scripture uh, in certain segments, and, it, and then it's your, you finish up with the story, if you will. Hmm. And I was wondering if there was a, a conscious effort on your part, or if not, uh, how you constructed the show. Did you construct it off of having gone to, gone to church in your early youth or mm -hmm. along your life? Hmm. Well, the church I went to uh, was a church without liturgy. It was uh, it was a f um, evangelical uh, fundamentalist church, the Sanctified Brethren, and uh, and and there um, men in the in the assembly stood up as the Spirit led, and they and they spoke or they gave out a, a verse or a hymn or something. The singing was much worse than on a Prairie Home Companion. <laughs> It was a cappella singing, and it was there was a kind of a wailing, kind of a kind of a mournful uh, quality of it. So, sort of, sort of, a, uh, sort of like a, a f fisher, uh, the wives of fishermen mourning for their lost husbands. Uh, um, if you want to know the truth, um, I, I'm not in that uh, church anymore. But I don't, I wouldn't see a, a connection there. 
I'm, um... Um, I, I go to a, 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 a sad um, Episcopal church, uh, a fading uh, Episcopal church, high, high church, you know, with smoke and mirrors, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there, you know, you, you have your uh, processional, your opening hymn, you've got your readings from scripture, your little prayer set in there, we all chant the psalm, and, uh, and, and then the gospel, and then the sermon. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so, but, um, but, but, but you're not the first person to think that a Prairie Home Companion was a sort of a, a church. I think maybe people are listening to it on Sunday morning, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they're hoping to get credit for it. Uh, and, uh, so, that, so, that's what they, so that's what they're referring to. The store is closing in 10 minutes, so. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder, how often do you do this? I feel like this is almost a stealth event. I just happened to learn about this by being here in the bookstore the other day and seeing that you were doing a reading here, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem like this is... You know, I mean, this is this is really wonderful. This isn't like a huge arena, and everyone is a hundred yards away from you. You mm. know, and mm. you know, we're all we're all just very close here, and this mm. is really nice. So, is this unusual for you to do, instead of a big concert, a big performance, or do you do these sort of small, intimate gatherings more often? Well, I, I I'm I'm doing a number of them for this uh, for this book uh, because I owe it to them. I owe it to the publisher, even for even for the tiny advance they paid me for this. Uh, I, um, I still have um, I still have a contract to write uh, two more books for Viking, and then I would like to actually write a couple more after that, and so to build credit um, at this uh, big publishing house, which is now merged, you know, with Random House, and so it's. Enormous. Um, I need to. Um, I need to go around and uh, and win uh, and curry favor uh, among um, you know book booksellers and uh, and and book salesmen. But no, I do. I do this. Uh, I do this often. Um, all the more so as the show uh, goes on, because uh, um, although a Prairie Home Companion is produced independently. Uh, by an independent production company. Um, nonetheless, there are all of these number crunchers in public radio uh, who have um, audience numbers and, uh, and, and uh, data on demographics. And um, I'm not interested in what they have to say, and so I need to have uh, another reality of actual people who I look at and who I assume listen to the show. I don't know. I'm not passing out questionnaires, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I need to have a feeling that this show is done for 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 real real people and not and not for a chart, you know. And so that's my that's my reason for for doing it. I I did uh, a little uh, reading or whatever you call this um, uh, in. Uh, in Phoenix, and uh, a 106-year-old woman named Pearl was there on her daughter's arm, but she, Pearl, was sharp as a tack, and her hearing was very good, and her eyesight, 106. She just was a little shaky on her legs, but otherwise she was in fine fettle, and she said, I hope you're not planning to retire anytime soon. <laughs> and, uh, and when a woman of 106 <laughs> wants you to stick around, I mean, it sort of gets your, sort of gets your attention. But uh, I would never know about her from, you know, reading, reading charts and so forth. Yes, sir? What's your average day like? Are you an early riser? Do you stay up late, late? What's your um, coffee drinker? Uh-huh. <laughs> What's the secret here? Uh-huh. 
Uh -huh. uh, well, I used to um, I used to uh, sleep late, and then uh, about about uh, eleven years ago, um, just on my own hook, uh, for very good reason, I I just um, cut off uh, drinking alcohol uh, in any form whatsoever, and um, and it was. Um, it, it, it changed uh, my my day. Uh, when you when you stop drinking, it gives you back your morning, <laughs> uh, which before had been you know clouded, and uh, and sometimes you wouldn't really get real morning until noon. And and uh, uh, but but when you don't drink, then then your mind is uh, is 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 quite clear when you get up in the morning, and. Um, so I, I go to bed before my daughter does. She's 16. Um, I go to bed around 9, and, uh, and I like to get up around 4. And, uh, and that, gives me, that gives me four hours before things are really cracking at, uh, at our house. And those four hours, uh, depending on the time of year, um, are partly in the dark. And uh, I like to sit in the dark with a cup of coffee and, uh, and a laptop in, uh, in a little room in my house downstairs and, and sit and, and work. And, uh, and that's when you've got your best work done. Um, when you've been working on something the day before and you, and you, and you come to a point of, of, of blockage or or confusion and you and you just cannot see where it's supposed to go the solution almost always is to put it away and don't worry it and get up early the next morning and look at it and the answer will be there that's is what I find to be true um, what do I do in an average day um, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. I I I work. Um, I don't have hobbies that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I I I, I go to movies to uh, uh, accompany my wife, and uh, I go to the opera to accompany my wife, and uh, and I go to you know if, if the orchestra is playing Mahler, we go hear Mahler because that's what my wife wants to do, and I'm fine with that. So I guess my wife is my hobby, really. <laughs> but um, but um, I like that. I um, I I'm a, a sociable person, um, but I'm but I'm almost always silent in company, and so there are not too many people who can tolerate that. Um, my own family does um, very well. Uh, my in-laws, not so well. A silent man sitting at the table. I guess it is odd, but um, but it's just uh, it's just how I how I am. I think when you talk on the radio for a living, um, you're not inclined to give speeches at the dinner table. <laughs> I'm I'm a writer, and writers are listeners. You know, we're we're observers. That's what we're supposed to do. That's where we get our ideas, and all the more so as it's as it's Thursday, and uh, and the show is on Saturday, and you need you need material. You get very quiet. <laughs> yes. Was there a blah, blah, blah? Yes, yes, in the back, yes. How, how can one get a uh, beautiful, mellifluous voice like you have? <laughs> well, you, 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 you spend 40 years in radio, uh, I think, and, uh, and, it, and, it, and it, weathers, it weathers your voice. Um, you, go through, you, go, you go through different periods of, of, of imitation in, in radio because you you know you have a good ear and um, and and so you 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 hear other voices especially when you're younger and you and you 
imitate them. I started out sounding like Edward R. Murrow, uh, or tried to, and, uh, and I think there was a time when I imitated Chet Huntley, the newscaster. <laughs> and you are all illegal trespassers. <laughs> Um, so, so, but, but, but over, over the years, you, you develop this, uh, you develop a, a voice for yourself, which is not necessarily the voice that you grew up with, but, uh, but, it, but it's, but it's the voice that you, uh, that jibes with what you, what you hear. In other words, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so is that... That covered, yes, yes, sir. I just want to say thank you for that wonderful tribute album you did uh, about Mark Twain. Oh. All those other great artists. Oh, yeah. A few years ago. I oh, really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, I loved, uh, I loved, I'm, I'm not sure which album you're referring to, but um, <laughs> but I did read um, Huckleberry Finn uh, on, a, on an audio uh, CD and. Uh, one and, with uh, uh, Clint Eastwood and all the music. Oh, that one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't all do that at the same time in the same yeah, studio, right. but uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, ha I haven't heard that myself. Well, maybe someday I'll take a long car trip. Yes, sir. You've been, you've been asked many questions. What question never gets asked? <laughs> well. <laughs> the, um, the question that... Um, that um, my aunt, a, a couple of my aunts used to ask me um, that I keep waiting for somebody to ask me, and, and nobody ever does. Was that, would that qualify? Thumbs up. All right, okay. Um, they, would, they would say, um, are you resting in the Lord? They would say. Uh, sometimes they would say, are you saved? You know, do, do you have the knowledge of salvation? Uh, are you resting in the Lord? They would come right direct, straight, right straight at you. Because uh, every summer there was a, a revival service and uh, an evangelist, um, um, Brother Bob would come uh, to town with this enormous Bible in his left hand and he would stride up and down in front of um, you know, there were probably 50, 60 people there under the tent, and, uh, and, and you had never come forward, and your aunts were aware of this, and so they would always ask you that question, are you resting in the Lord, are you, do you, do you, do you know where you're going when you die, and, uh, and but, but nobody ever asks me that question anymore. <laughs> Are you, are, you, are you resting in the Lord? Are you resting in the Lord? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very, good, uh, very good question. How would you answer them at that point in time? How did you answer your aunts then? How did I answer that question when I was a kid? Yes. Yeah. I didn't want to worry my aunts. I loved my aunts. I loved them dearly. And I would say whatever I believed they wanted me to say. And, and to, to preserve their feelings and, 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 to, and to give them uh, a sense of security and peace. I would always say yes. Always. Myself, I wasn't sure at all, but, but, I, but for my aunt's sake, I would. I would. Yeah. Because if I'd said no, they would have, it would have been, they just would have been tortured. My, we've certainly brought up some heavy things here. <laughs> and uh, all of you people facing arrest here, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I uh, went up and applied for a job there doing an early morning radio show. And, uh, and that, was, that was a great uh, awakening. A Prairie Home Companion started out as a morning show. And, uh, and uh, that's, what, that's what I was referring to before when I, when I said that at five o'clock in the morning, a dark view of life is, gets, you, gets you nothing. 
It was an amazing thing for an English major to feel that you are of use and, and, and to be useful to other people. And, uh, and, and although an English major might start out by feeling superior to an audience and, and feeling that, you know, you, brilliant as you are, could never really truly be understood by anybody. And so you are this lonely, unappreciated figure. But in time, you grow up and you, and, and you, and you want to be of use to, to people. I still do. Uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know any greater, any greater pleasure. Well, I do know greater pleasure, but, you know, that's, <laughs> that's something else. Three-minute corn? Pardon? Three-minute corn? Three-minute corn? Sweet corn. Sweet corn. Sweet corn. Sweet corn, yeah, yeah, yeah. You only boiled it for three minutes? What? Really? 50 seconds. Uh, out of the minutes. garden and into the, into the boiling water. Oh, really? Really? Three minutes? Three minutes. Then, that would seem to be a kind of um, medium rare to me. But, uh, <laughs> But maybe it's better. I thought it was always five or six. No? 50 seconds. What? 50 seconds. Really? Really? So we've been overcooking our sweet corn? Well, corn has changed a lot. Oh, my sugar, gosh. There's a lot more sugar in it now. Oh, really? Okay. All right. All right. Well, I will go home and, uh, and, uh, and uh, repair my ways. Yes, sir. Last question, sir. In the... Gentleman here in the in the white cap. The uh, uh, did, I was going to ask um, when were you at the University of Minnesota and mm -hmm. and did you ever know John Berryman? Um, yes, yes. Uh, I was at the University of Minnesota uh, from the fall of 1960 um, until um, 1968 through 1968. I stayed in graduate school uh, hoping to uh, be excused from Vietnam and, uh, and so I stayed in school much longer than I really wanted to. And uh, Mr. John Barrowman, author of the Dream Songs, was, uh, was a large uh, figure on campus. Uh, his centenary is this year. John Barrowman was one more of those writers who who waged a lifelong struggle with alcohol. And, um, and this was perfectly clear whenever he gave readings, which he often did. And he would stand up in front of an audience in the uh, Museum of Natural History Auditorium at the university and, 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 and read from his poems, which were difficult enough <laughs> to read them on the page, but to hear him slur his words as he stood up there and holding on to the lectern like a life raft. And, uh, and um, no, he was an example of, 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 of the old alcoholic tradition of American, of American letters. He, um, he, uh, he, um, he, he achieved sobriety through AA. And, uh, and maintained sobriety uh, for the most part. Um, and, and then a, a, a few years later, he, he committed suicide. He was, um, he was a man who was haunted by the fact that his father uh, had uh, committed suicide with a shotgun uh, standing on the lawn of the family home under the boy's bedroom window one, one night. And this was an enormous, an enormous wound uh, that Mr. Barrowman uh, worked around in his work and often referred to in, in, different, in different ways. Um, when I heard that, I, I realized that I could not be a serious artist because I had the burden of a happy childhood. And, uh, and uh, my father had always been perfectly decent and wonderful to me and uh, you know I mean he'd made me hoe potatoes and uh, <laughs> I was forced to memorize verses every Sunday but that's hardly the same thing so so then thank you so very much <laughs>